Um, I want to welcome everyone to our first Finger Lakes forecast webinar. I'm Gay Nicholson. I'm the president of Sustainable Tompkins, and I'm so glad that you could join with us today as we explore the topic of food security and climate disruption here in the Finger Lakes region. I'm joined by our outreach coordinator, Sarah Nickerson, and um, Ryan Kincaid, our program coordinator. We're offering this webinar series as a place where we can learn together uh, about the forecast for how climate change will impact our lives and our regional economy. For our spring series, April, May, and June, uh, we're going to take a look at our food system, flood risk, and the growing threat of harmful algae blooms in our lakes. And then next fall, we're going to take a look at public health, the land use changes, and renewable energy, and the potential for maybe very large demographic and economic shifts um, in our uh, as climate disruption progresses in our in our across our country. Our webinars are going to be at noon on the last Wednesday of the month, but if you can't join us, then you can just register for the webinar and we'll send you a link to the recording. So today we're going to explore how our changing climate is affecting food production and food security in our region. Um, first, we're going to be sharing a short film that was created by Shira Evergreen of Uplifted Ithaca for the Tracy Matrano campaign back in 2020. And then after the film, we're going to hear from our four guest panelists who bring really a wealth of knowledge and expertise from the front lines of climate change in our region, out on our, our farms and um, in the research sector. Uh, Katie House is the coordinator of the Tompkins Food System Plan being developed by Tompkins Food Future. They're taking a, a whole systems approach that has been very influenced by the need to prepare for climate impacts. And then we will have uh, Graham Savio, who's um, the agriculture and horticulture leader at Cooperative Extension of Tompkins County. Graham's been working on both the projected shifts in food production and the role that our farming community can play in slowing down climate change. And then we'll hear from Klaus Martins, who is a very well-known organic grain producer from Penyan, who has been a leader in New York for all sorts of research projects to improve soil health and reduce pest pressure with organic farming methods. Uh, you'll meet Klaus in the film as well as the owner of Lakeview Organic Farms, or Organic Grain. And then uh, Chow Cheng may need no introduction to those who frequent the Ithaca Farmers Market. He runs Stick and Stone Farm with his wife, Lucy, where they raise a really wide variety of beautiful fresh, vegetable, fresh market vegetables um, nearly year round. Um, so our Farmers in Flux, Adapting to Climate Change film features interviews with four regional farmers who are starting to experience new constraints and challenges uh, to their production practices from extreme weather, um, even as they're seeing some maybe new opportunities as they adapt to a new climate regime. And we're really grateful to Tracy Matrano and Shira Evergreen for sharing this film with us today um, for our webinar. And uh, now to here to introduce the film is uh, Shira Evergreen of Uplifted Ithaca. Uh, great, thank you, Gay. Um, hi, I'm Shira. I'm a documentary filmmaker with a long time interest in sustainability. Uh, this film was unique in that I was approached by a political campaign and their goal, as I understood it, was to use the film to connect to more rural voters, more conservative voters, more, quote, swing voters, um, to help them realize how interconnected their livelihoods are with the health of our soil and land. Um, and to hopefully inspire them to vote for Tracy for Congress. The plan was to have a series of screenings and conversations around the district leading up to the 2020 election. Um, but then the pandemic happened and the film ended up being shown like a couple of times at some small fundraising events, but that was pretty much it. So uh, I'm very excited for it to get out into the world. Um, and I'm hoping that even some people on this Zoom uh, uh, some of you in the audience might be able to think of ways to use it in classrooms to show to policymakers, and of course to share it with more farmers and people in the agricultural community. Thank you. Thanks, Shira. Okay, Sarah, you can roll them.
My name is Autumn Stoshek, and I own and operate, along with my husband, a small orchard and cidery. And we make uh, traditional methods, sparkling ciders, from the apples we grow on our certified organic farm. I've always felt that there's a very, very fundamental part of being a human that is having a relationship with the land that, that you are occupying and live on, and realizing how much we are just like a tiny little piece of a very, very, very long timeline, and how at the same time we have this capacity to have a profound impact on the land that we're living on and taking care of. As a young person, I saw in our region a lot of like economic decline, and part of the economic decline definitely was the loss of a rural economy that small farmers had in this, in this area for a while. And that always struck me as really sort of ironic or odd given the like abundance of natural resources we have here. I mean, it's a pretty unique spot in the world where we have all the rainfall that we need and that we can draw fresh, clean water out of the ground sort of almost endlessly, and that it's sunny and not too hot, and that it gets cold in the winter but not too cold. So I think that abundance combined with being privileged enough to grow up on this piece of land that I could caretake for really inspired me to try to get creative and think about how we could make a living off of the land. We have a 75 acre farm, but we're only intensively cultivating about 12 acres of land um, into the orchard. And the rest is like a wonderful natural wild habitat that supports the ecosystem that our orchards are part of. We produce about 24,000 bottles a year. What that means is that there's a full-time job for my husband, myself, and um, our employee and our intern. And we distribute to uh, eight different states and one other country, <laughs> we're now distributed in Scotland. It is actually possible to like grow and build a fair economy off of agriculture. And the support has been especially strong for small producers and branding New York State itself as like a craft beverage producer, I think has helped create that community and it's good for everybody for sure. When I think about climate change, the biggest thing I think of is extremes. We may get weather that's just way, 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 way too warm too early. That sets the spring phenology off. The frost free date is May 30th, and that's still true. Like we still sometimes get frosts that late. If you have a warm up in March that causes the blossoms to open up in March, then the, the chance of you getting like a really big freeze later on is really high. And that's actually happened twice in the past six years where the, the crop across the state was reduced. So that's the one thing that's, that is really scary and really impactful because if you lose your crop, you lose your crop. Like, what are you gonna do? Last year, it started raining in August and it literally didn't stop for nine months. Um, I thought, oh, our, our English cider varieties are just gonna love this weather because I felt like it was in maritime England, you know? That kind of extreme can create a lot of stress for trees. They didn't get enough sunlight to photosynthesize. The roots are soggy because the ground is saturated all the time. With a tree, it's like this perennial plant. It lives for a long time. It's pretty resilient, you know, but on the other hand, it's not like you can replace it. So it's not like an annual crop where you say like, all right, this was a crop failure. We're going to try again next year. And so now I wonder what, what kind of stress we're going to see next year from the effects of that nine month soggy wet period. I think that like everything else in our economy, we, have an incentive to turn things into dollars as efficiently as possible, but we don't have any penalty for externalizing the costs of doing that, whether it's into the environment or onto workers or people living in the environment. And so I'd love to see some type of system of reward for farmers who are banking carbon, for example. Just that alone, 
would suddenly change the game and people would start thinking about perennial cropping systems, for example, or they would think more about recycling nutrients, or they would think more about uh, reducing tillage and um, keeping the soil covered. I think that's a really, one of my best ideas. <laughs>
that whole crop subsidy thing, I'm not a huge fan of, although I do participate in it. What they do have that's good and what could be promoted more is programs through NRCS and soil and water that give subsidy payments or incentive payments to plant cover crops and diversify the mixture of crops that guys are growing. As an example, this year, Soil and Water is giving Tompkins County a $60 per acre payment if you plant a cover crop that is going to overwinter and cover the soil as an incentive to guys to get the soil covered, reduce erosion, and reduce pollution into the lake. The programs are out there. Maybe those need to be promoted more. Maybe the payments need to be a little higher instead of giving us so much subsidy to just plant corn and soybeans, because this is taxpayer money, right? Okay, we need farmers, we need food, but the, the whole problem is food is too cheap, period. It's so cheap, farmers can't make a living growing it. And that's really the issue. And I think if farmers have money, they're making a good living, they're not so strapped trying to extract every penny they can from the land, then they can do some of these extra things to conserve it. You know, it could be that the guys are trying to farm so many acres just to try to get by that they don't even have time to do it. So I don't know, do we create a, a soil loss core like the Peace Corps and, and a whole bunch of young people are going around with no-till planters and going behind the corn silage fields and putting rye in? Hey, maybe that's awesome. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of cool things we can do. I, I don't know. Titus. Um, we have a Adventureland farm, the two of us. Um, it's kind of a, a base for all the other things that we do in the community. We've done all kinds of different things. We've raised crops, corn and soybeans and so forth, and Holstein replacement heifers and the hogs and, and then Angus Cross uh, beef cattle. And then we finally got into the Devons and made the decision to switch from kind of a typical beef operation where you feed grain and so forth uh, to an all grass operation. And we also got involved in a new fencing technology around 1980 that really allowed us to manage the animals on pasture better. And since I think about 1990, the whole farm has been covered with grass. We haven't grown any crops, we haven't plowed anything. And so we have a pretty rich pasture land that's very diverse in the crops that are on it. And um, I'm really happy with that method of beef cattle production. We're really a grass farm. Uh, we raise beef cattle, but this is really a grass farm and it's the grass that we manage. It allows us to be more flexible with weather conditions. We've had some challenges with too much rain, with not enough rain. But generally, when we do what we're doing with rotational grazing, we can make adjustments that allow us to go through the season without any major disasters. The main subsidies are in corn and soybeans and other things like that. And they certainly do move the market in a certain direction. If corn is really cheap because it's subsidized, then beef farmers and livestock producers will feed more corn and more soybeans. And that's really the reason that what we're doing is not a, a mainstream thing because research and research money has always gone into corn and soybean production since, since the 1950s. In the last four years, we have not really had what I would call a normal season. We had a year of really severe drought uh, the only other time we had a drought as bad as that one was in 1980s when Mount St. Helens erupted and sent a huge plume of dust across the continent and we didn't get rain for a couple of months. This was that kind of drought. Uh, the fields just dried up. There was just nothing there. Uh, last summer, last August, we had nine inches of rain fall on our farm in about two hours. We actually did not have a lot of water remaining on our farm after that storm. It came down so hard and so fast that it just, it moved right to the creeks and down to the lake where it caused all kinds of damage. 
So that's kind of a, a fast motion example of water runoff. And all that water just ended up down in the lake. So when we have runoff, we want it to be clean runoff. The algal blooms and, and things that we've been experiencing lately in, in the lakes, it's certainly agriculture is part of that. Uh, but there are other causes for it as well. Um, certainly anywhere there's a, a sizable community, there's so much hard surface in city areas and the water just runs into the drain sewers and, and out into the water supply. And when people use chemicals and fertilizers and things like that on their lawns, that's where it ends up. And it gets there a lot quicker because there's a lot fewer filters that it goes through before it ends up in the water. But also there's some, there are some lakes in the Adirondacks that are miles and miles and miles away from any source of agricultural pollution or community pollution um, that are also having algal blooms. So this may be partly related to the kinds of changes we're beginning to experience in the weather. Um, it's something that everybody has to deal with and everybody has to look at their little piece of it and see what it is that they can do um, to improve that situation but it also needs a lot more research to understand what's causing it well in the early 1990s uh, the farm crisis was just coming to a close and my wife and I had split a partnership from my brothers and we were looking for a way to make a living and farm prices were poor. We were not able to maintain a good standard of living being farmers. So we had to look at niches and alternatives. And the big thing organic did for us, it's a tremendous marketing tool. And we already knew that having more diversity on our farm made our farm more productive and made our farm stronger but we didn't have markets for a lot of the crops that would have been good to have in our system. And when we started selling organically, we suddenly had a market for almost anything we wanted to grow. When I was in high school, this, this unfortunately dates me a little bit. I've been around several decades, more than a lot of people. Uh, we would hear about the first frost in some valleys of this county coming the 28th of August some years. This was back 40 years ago. Uh, today, uh, most of New York went well into October before the first frost. Uh, we're not expecting a frost here until sometime in mid-November, maybe. The biggest negative uh, consequence has been the unpredictability, where, for instance, 2012 was such a warm season. We had our fruit trees were all blooming in early March. That's not normal. That's not when fruit trees should be blooming. And then we had one night of freak frost in April that destroyed the crop. Now, that's, that's a big negative. We're also getting much more intense rainfall. Over the past 30 years, uh, corn, uh, meteorologists are telling us that we've got 70% heavier peak intensity of rainfall. Uh, we're getting much longer periods when it's of dry, dry weather and much longer periods of extremely wet weather. Uh, so the extremes are all going in all directions. The general trend is toward warmer but it's the unpredictability that is really hardest on farmers. This spring, for instance, we were in, caught in a very long wet period and crops were not able to get planted and very little of the corn was planted at the normal time. So we're fortunate that we were abnormally warm in the fall because very little of the corn would have matured if we hadn't had an abnormally late fall. Now that still has lowered yields because corn that's not planted at the prime planting season doesn't yield as well as corn that is. One way that we've responded to that as organic farmers, and this is where the organic market has been tremendous for us, is we've increased the diversity on our farm. And our best insurance against climate change is increased diversity so that we won't ever be wiped out on everything we grow. When we have all our eggs in one basket and we get a bad year for corn, we've got a real disaster on our hands. And I don't consider crop insurance risk management. Uh, that's, that's only disaster management. The subsidy structure has pushed our farmers toward what's called program crops. Those are crops that are being encouraged with uh, different types of price supports. And since the recent trade agreements have gone away from direct subsidies, 
but we have hidden subsidies. So they become subsidies on insurance, crop insurance payments, for instance, or um, the ethanol mandate, which requires a certain amount of the fuel that's burned to have ethanol in it, which creates artificially a market for some of the corn. Uh, that makes us more dependent on that one crop, especially it makes us more dependent on the crops that have that are considered program crops. And it uh, discourages farmers, frankly, from going into these other crops that could make us more resilient and that could be uh, very useful in this extreme change in climate. We grow, at one time I think we counted over 20 crops. And a lot of our crops are cover crops or double crops, where with climate change we've been able to grow two crops. For instance, we can harvest our malting barley and then plant a crop of dry edible beans afterwards because there's, the season has gotten long enough that that's possible. I think climate change is the elephant in the room. We're, we're not farming in the same environment that we did 40 years ago, and we're certainly not farming in the same environment that we will be in 20 years or in 30 years. And to be able to adapt to that, uh, we have to recognize that we need to become more flexible, more innovative, and more ready to try new things, more uh, eager to try new things. To me, our saving grace is going to be biodiversity. It's going to be having more diversity on our farms and also having our soil covered more of the time, having more cover crops because the carbon that's in the atmosphere, much of it used to be in the soil. If you take New York soils, when uh, Western agriculture started here, when the first settlers came, the organic matter would run five to 6%. At this point, it's difficult to find farms that average over 2% in this state. Now we've lost, that means we've lost close to two thirds of the organic matter that was in that soil. We can do the calculations. It's a huge amount. Uh, we talk about the amount of carbon being released by fossil fuels, but we really should not forget the vast amount of carbon that is being released from the soil. We'd, but also the amount that we could be storing in the soil if we change the way we've managed that soil. So climate change is both a threat and an opportunity for agriculture. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. And that's a powerful film in my opinion, <laughs> um, with, um, with also some of my favorite people in that film um, who have been leading the way here in our region and paying attention. Uh, so uh, now I'd like to uh, get um, onto our panel um, to follow up on that film to explore, you know, really, what lies ahead for our regional food system as climate change bites deeper into the fabric of our lives here. So first up will be Katie Hallis from Tompkins Food Future. And I know you have some slides as well to share. Thank you, Gay. Thank you, Shira. Really enjoyed seeing the film in its entirety. Um, I'm just gonna get my slides up and running here and uh, let's see. It's always the hardest part. <laughs> okay, just going. This is a little different. Oops. Looks like it's loading. Mm -hmm. All right. Does everyone see slides here? Yes. Great, okay. All right, thanks everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Katie Hallis and I'm here today on behalf of Tompkins Food Future, which is a, a community planning initiative to bring about Tompkins County's first ever comprehensive food system plan. And um, as you might imagine, uh, we focused quite a bit on climate and food security. So I'm gonna, 
talk a bit about that today, um, just share a little bit about our work and also what we've been learning and what, what's ahead. Um, so like air and water, food is necessary to our survival and we as a community here in Tonkins plan for a lot of aspects of uh, life and community that impact us on a daily basis, but we don't have a food system plan. And so um, some of these reasons that you see listed here, uh, climate impacts, uh, affordability of food, uh, food insecurity among residents, which tracks pretty closely with um, national trends, as well as um, public health, the diet and nutrition related impacts of our food system. These were all um, sort of the, the motivating factors that brought this process um, to fruition. And we've been working for about two years now um, in partnership with the Tompkins County Legislature, the Community Foundation of Tompkins County uh, Cooperative Extension, uh, Tompkins uh, County, and, and lots of other partners to, um, to bring about this food system plan. I'll talk a little bit about what we've been working on. Um, out of this two-year uh, community engagement process, uh, we've identified a collective vision for a food system that is resilient, equitable, and healthy for all members of the community. And we've focused primarily on um, working to better understand the current state of our food system. And when we say food system, we have sort of a soil to soil approach. So in that graphic there, you can see the different areas that we focused on, everything from farming to what happens to food when we're done with it or dispose of it. Um, so we, we, in the fall of 2021, released uh, the first ever baseline assessment of our food system which looked at, uh, looked to uncover the challenges, gaps, vulnerabilities, uh, concerns among community members in our food system. Also to really identify so that we can build on the strengths and assets of our local food system and to start developing a vision for our future and the specific ideas and recommendations, projects and policies and actions that could help us to achieve that vision. In the process, um, and I'll just note that's linked there. So that link will take you to our website where you can read the executive summary, as well as um, the in-depth reports for each of those areas. In the process, we've connected with over uh, 50 organizations and businesses, close to 2000 individuals who have lent their voices, their time, their expertise to the process. And the plan itself, which will really be um, a, a community, owned roadmap for how we work towards food system improvement is due out this summer. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that in just a couple of minutes. But it proposes three directions to move in, um, nine specific goals and about 50 recommendations that um, could, um, could be undertaken. So I wanna spend a couple of minutes, um, before I go to that, just a couple of minutes sort of providing a little bit of context, um, starting globally, working down to the state level, and then talking a bit about what's going on uh, locally and particularly with this food system plan. I do wanna say, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which, um, you know, March, 2020, this project started up in earnest in April, 2020. So that's just been the lens we've been looking through the entire time. And the, to uh, the, the pandemic has really been uh, a harbinger of what's to come in our food system. Um, we know that this, you know, we've learned a lot and are still learning a lot about the shocks uh, to our food system as a result of a crisis like this one. And we know there's more to come. And so more than ever, having a plan, being intentional about, um, you know, the vulnerabilities that we want to address and the future that we want to create, um, it, it, the time really is now. Um, so I wanted to just share briefly, uh, folks may have seen this, but the, the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which just came out this spring um, in, its, in Chapter 5 on food security, opens up with this statement, climate change is already disrupting the world's supply of food and water more significantly than previously thought, and those disruptions will get worse. So it, not a great outlook, um, <laughs> but also not surprising. 
uh, to, to many of us. It, uh, the report goes on to talk about existing impacts that we're currently seeing, such as food shortages and water insecurity globally. Of course, uh, there's, uh, you know, differentials depending on geography. Some places, particularly in the global south, are more vulnerable, less developed nations, more vulnerable. Um, it projects what we might expect with one and a half degrees of warming. So increased crop losses, increased food, sa food safety risks. And it talks about how, um, you know, long term, we should expect that food will be harder to grow. There will be disruptions to ecological processes that govern our ability to grow food, such as soil health, pollination, pest threats, and um, more water scarcity as well. The conclusion, and that's what I'd really love to focus on and what really gives me hope is that, um, and, and they use this word transformation, food system transformation is necessary. Yes, we know this and, and it's possible. Um, we're just not doing enough yet. And what they really focus on in terms of the sort of tenets of that transformation, the most um, impactful strategies are um, around agroecology, agroforestry, and agricultural diversification, which I know others will talk more about today. Um, and I did have the opportunity to speak with one of the lead authors of this chapter who happens to live in Tompkins County. Um, and, you know, we talked about the fact that while Tompkins County is an incredibly well-resourced place, and while we are less vulnerable or exposed to threats like tornadoes, hurricanes, um, we, you know, sea level rise, we are not immune. One thing to hammer home from this report and from these findings, um, which I encourage people to look at more closely uh, just by Googling this, um, if, if you're interested in getting into some of the details, no one, um, no one will be spared. So even the most privileged among us who currently experience food security will experience disruptions, will experience price increases, uh, shortages of food supply, extreme weather events that impact um, our agricultural production. Um, so again, um, planning for that is essential. At the state level, um, just a couple things I wanna draw people's attention to. Uh, the, the New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, also called the Climate Act, was passed in 2019. And this legislation mandates a 40% reduction in emissions by 2030 and 85% um, towards net zero by mid-century. And chapter 15 of this, um, of this report, uh, which is the, the scoping plan for how these uh, reductions will actually be achieved, uh, addresses agriculture. I encourage people to check that out. The public comment period is currently open, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity right now to help guide what strategies will be prioritized. Um, and I will say, uh, you know, in New York State, this, it's different everywhere, of course, but New York State's economy um, accounts, or I'm sorry, New York State's agricultural economy accounts for 6% of our total emissions. So relatively small um, compared to some other sectors of the New York State economy, but uh, you know, still a lot of work ahead to figure out how to achieve those reductions. Uh, the second report is called Climate. This was put out by NYSERDA a few years ago now, 2014. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of lays out uh, climate projections, vulnerabilities, impacts, and adaptation strategies in New York State, and sort of the, the impacts with the highest confidence um, of, of, of impact are some heat stress, increased, increased weed and pest pressure, um, frost and freeze damage, summer droughts, heavy rainfall, and flood damage. And so these are the things we're already seeing, already experiencing, and notably um, these impacts are going to continue and accelerate. So that's sort of the takeaway from that piece. And lastly, um, wanted to note a recent study that came out in the last couple of years that analyzed the most effective uh, strategies for mitigating and adapting to climate change in the agricultural sector, and those are noted below. Um, so important lessons for the implementation of the, the CLCP and, and other um, initiatives. So I'm just going to end by um, sharing a little bit of a preview of what's coming down the pike with the food system plan. 
Um, we, I talked about the three directions and what we heard from the community was that we need to move our food system in these three directions. So to build resilience, uh, to cultivate equity, sovereignty and economic opportunity and to promote human and ecosystem health. Um, so there's nine goals in the food system plan. Climate change shows up throughout, um, but the first goal is to mitigate and adapt to climate change, um, sorry, to climate risks that impact uh, the food system. And below you can see a few of the specific recommendations that uh, will likely be included. So there's much more there, um, but just to give folks a little bit of an idea and um, I'll just end by inviting people to contribute. The best way to do that right now is to uh, review our draft, which is out for public comment. So if you look at that blue turquoise box where it says comment, if you click that link, um, you'll be able to read the draft, which includes all of the recommendations and provide your comments. Um, you can also read more on our website. You can always email me, I'd love to hear from you. And um, another way to connect with the effort is to um, come join a food policy council meeting, which meets monthly on the third Friday of the month at 9 a.m. And you can um, reach Don Barber, who's the chair via that link. Um, I just wanna thank our funders and supporters and especially today, Sustainable Tompkins for having me here to be part of this really important conversation. So thanks again, and um, please do reach out um, for anything. Thank you so much, Katie, uh, for that overview. And so, Graham, um, you're up next. I want to tell us what the uh, Cooperative Extension is doing on the on the research and mitigation and climate front. Thanks, Kate. All right, and thanks, Katie, for that great uh, great sort of setting the stage and getting us started here. I'm working on sharing my screen here. All right, are you seeing my presentation mode or my notes mode? Notes mode. Notes mode, all right. How about now? Got, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks everybody for being here today. This is a really important topic and, and really happy to be able to have this conversation and looking forward to the, the conversation at the end of it all. Um, so this is, this is an overview of what I'm gonna run through here today. And, um, I'm going to skim through the recommend the implications, um, the projections and the implications to some extent, because there isn't a ton of time here and I want to be able to spend a little bit of time on the recommendations and the extension resources. Um, so in terms of the projected changes to our climate, this, this is, this is what we're looking at, um, from, and this is actually from the climate aid report that, uh, that Katie gave a nod to. So this is from 2014, these projections. Um, so we're looking at um, increases in, in annual temperature and in, and in precipitation um, in ways that are largely, um, largely homogenous across New York State in terms of averages, but um, the real changes are going to be in, in terms of the, the, the specificity of the extreme impacts like um, hurricanes and sea level rise and intensity of snowfall. Those sorts of things are going to be a lot more scattered and, and variable across the state, often in ways that are relatively favorable for central New York and the southern tier, um, sea level rise, hurricanes, and, and, and sort of the, the, lake, the lake effect snowfall, less impactful on, on us here than, than, than the rest of New York State. Um, general increases here in the southern tier in particular, we're looking at a six to 10 Per six to 10 degree incre increase by the 2080s in this area and a two to five inch increase in precipitation by the 2080s. And these slides are all gonna be shared at, out at the end. So I'm, I am gonna skim through these pretty quickly. Um, and here in terms of those extreme impacts, we're looking at a pretty substantial increase in days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, and a pretty substantial a 50% increase in two inch rain events days with two inch rain events and a 25% increase in one inch rain events. Um, these are increases from relatively low numbers. So, you know, less than one day per year with a two inch rain event, moving up to usually closer to one, one day per year. And I'll note in particular that the snowfall event last week in a lot of the region was a one inch rain, 
one inch rent event right there. Um, so that's one of one of our one of our allotted six at this point, and it's an, an allotted seven to eight um, by the 2080s. In terms of the implications for agriculture, and again, I'm skimming through this quick because I want to get to recommendations because I think that's the interesting part of this conversation. Um, th this is sort of what we're looking at. Again, a lot of this is from that climate report. Um, so new crops that, that, that we might have opportunities to grow can include uh, other available options for winter cover crops, which Klaus talked about on, um, in the video. Um, some of the ways that insects are going to be impacting us are through the, the fact that they'll be able to overwinter with warmer winter temperatures, the fact that they'll be able to come in earlier and start breeding earlier, the fact that they might be able to have more generations per growing season. So there are really substantial impacts from, from insects just because of that enhanced growing season. Um, and the, 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 the heat stress, um, well, you know, you, you, you guys can, can read, read the slide. There's a lot of words on, on the slide here, um, but those, those are the highlights. And then in, in terms, so these, these are the, the temperature impacts, the impacts from temperature. In terms of precipitation, um, we're looking at more late summer droughts and more high, more heavy rainfall events. Um, so with, with potential flooding and with more erosion. Um, and as, as again, I think Klaus was talking about harder to get on the field at the end of the year and in the beginning of the year. Um, there's also some hope that higher carbon dioxide levels can increase growth and yield for some of our crops. Um, that hope is, is sort of caveated with the fact that the increased growth is also happening among the weed species. And in most of the, most of the literature tends to say the weed species increases in growth outpace the crop species increases in growth. Um, in addition to herbicides becoming less effective. So that's, that's a concern. Um, and I, I just want to spend a quick moment on implications for California agriculture um, because there there is a bit of a conversation about New York to some extent taking over as a breadbasket for the United States in terms of a lot of these uh, fruit and vegetable crops that are currently produced in California. This is not an exhaustive assessment and this is just an example from California. There's also impacts all over the rest of the country but there are crops that we can grow in New York State that are going to be substantially impacted in California. Their, their ability to produce things in California is going to be substantially impacted. So there's some crops here that we might think about exploring in New York State. Almonds and table grapes in particular, there are cold hardy almonds and table grapes can be produced in New York State. Um, and then the winter chilling effect for perennial crops in particular is pretty substantial in the Central Valley of California. Um, so apples, cherries, pears are going to be virtually impossible to produce in California. Um, and then pretty substantial impacts on, on other fruits as well, um, including, including chestnuts, which is one that's sort of close to my heart. Um, so potential for us to, to take on some, some of that responsibility, producing some of these crops for, for, for the country. Um, so the part of this that I, that I would like to spend more time on, and I think I have about a minute and a half left um, to, to stay to the time, um, but in terms of what farmers can actually do around this, um, again, I, I don't want to read this whole list, but there's, there's a lot that farmers can do, and a lot of this is a little bit... Um, you know, these are these are extension recommendations, and I'm looking forward to Klaus and Chow going into um, how how these things really roll out on farms. How feasible are these things? Have you tried these things, and and how has it gone? Um, so I know Klaus talked about in the video enhancing diversity. So looking at new varieties um, and and new crops with with better resistances, heat drought tolerance. Um, if we're talking about some of those perennial crops that, that were previously grown in California and maybe will be grown here a little bit more, really we need to be thinking about freeze and frost protection in terms of where they're being cited and how they're being managed and what sort of varieties are being selected in terms of their flowering period. Um, ir irrigation capacity to make up for those late summer droughts is gonna be important. Um, it, this is this is the the second to last one is an interesting one with a lot of um, energy around it around the state. Renewable energy on farms is is kind of a hot topic, and there's a lot of potential to 
have renewable energy sited on marginal lands that aren't currently super productive, that are too sloped, that are that are otherwise not really accessible. Um, there's there's a lot of potential there, and that can be an income stream for farmers. Um, and then there's also potential income streams for farmers through a lot of grants through soil and water and NRCS that have that, that provide income as well as mitigating and adapting to climate change. And then in terms of what folks can do at home, um, what consumers and citizens can do, um, there's there's some key things that that I would encourage folks to keep in mind. Farmers have to be farmers are going to be doing a lot of adapting, and they need our understanding uh, around the fact that they may not be producing the exact variety that you've always grown, or the exact type of fruit that you've always grown, or the exact cut of meat that you've always been accustomed to. So some flexibility around that and some understanding around that is gonna be important. We need to prepare for a more expensive food system. That, that's a reality that that is coming with all of these enhanced, the, these increased costs for farmers, food prices are likely to go up and whatever we can do to, to, to keep equity considerations in mind there is gonna be really important. So sliding scale purchase pricing and other, other mechanisms, if you can pay more, that's a really, that's a really, really wonderful, valuable thing. Um, other mechanisms for subsidizing producers who are doing good things on their land. Um, you, these are things that you can talk to farmers about and encourage your legislators to, to think about. And this is just sort of a list, agroforestry systems, manure covers and flares, cover crops. These are all things that also came out of, um, I think that third report that Katie cited, which I've also cited in, in my reference at the end. So you'll have that link. Um, and, and of course, supporting local farms, supporting local businesses who are buying from local farms. Shifts in diet. Um, I actually have a, a quick slide about that. Um, so this is this is from an, a Lancet report from a couple of years back that tried to integrate recommendations for climate change from food production and nutrition implications for human diets. And the major recommendations here were a substantial decrease in the production of red meat. But there's nuance around that. That's not eliminating red meat. It's shifting it and it's reducing it, shifting it to more pasture-based systems and reducing it. Um, also, re not really growing the production of poultry, grains, or dairy over the coming 50, 30 years. And this last thing at the end, a substantial increase in nut production for the good of the planet and for the good of our health. Um, in terms of what we are doing at Extension, this is, this is a quick run through I wanna highlight again, uh, echo Katie's highlight from the IPCC's uh, chapter five. Food system transformation is key. Agroecology, agroforestry, agricultural diversification. So some of the ways that we are working with that at CCE, um, there are two statewide climate resiliency specialists who are now on board. Um, there are some interesting uh, funding sources coming down from the USDA that are, that are being applied for across the system. And there will be some great programming coming about as a result of that. And then um, we're working on a payment for ecosystem services pilot here in the Finger Lakes. And we're also working on agroforestry support, both at CC Tompkins. That's been a long running thing at Cornell Small Farms. NRCS provides support on that as well. Um, I'm just gonna finish here. These are references. And again, you'll get these slides. Um, these are some of the other folks at CC Tompkins who are working on some of these things. Uh, and Baz Perry works closely with Katie Hallis on, on the food system plan as well. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Graham. That was a uh, really rich information. And we will want to get your, the links to your slideshow and to Katie's to share back out with everybody who's attended. And, and uh, we'll get the link to the recording as well. Um, that was just fantastic. And I'm, I'm just so glad to see how much work is being done. And now I uh, we'd like to hear from our, our farmers. So how's it going for you guys? And what your what are your plans for adapting to all this? You want to go first, Klaus? Yeah, a few things just came to mind listening to this, and it brings back a conversation I had about 10 years ago with a German uh, leader of the Green Party who was also an economist, and he challenged the idea of subsidies. You know, 10 years ago, there was quite this hot discussion about American subsidies versus European subsidies, and he said, why don't we consider the fact that when you have a subsidy, you're transferring money away from the general public, from the taxpayers, to a very small group farmers and change it to a recognition that there are things farmers do that benefit their communities and they benefit the people around them. 
There are things that farmers can do that may be de detrimental. Maybe we should be paying farmers for the services that they're giving their communities that are not being currently compensated as a way to encourage farmers to farm in a way that will produce more of these beneficial services. Interesting ideas coming from an economist. And if we could just stop paying for things that may not be helping us, that would be a huge step in the right direction and then start transferring that money into things that are helping us it would take us a lot further. And he gave a really interesting example. He said in parts of Europe, the tourist industry is bigger than agriculture. But then he said, what is it the tourists are coming there to see? And there should be a type of a payment for an attractive farm that people want to be near. And he was giving examples of crops like canola that are a riot of yellow flowers in the field, uh, crops of sunflowers that give you a riot of color. And these are all crops that also are very healthy for the ecosystem. So I'm, I'm probably be beating a dead horse on diversity being the solution to most of our stresses. But I really think there are ways that if we can build the biodiversity into our farms, we'll make them stronger and more resilient, but we'll also make them produce beneficial services for our communities that our neighbors will want to pay for if they're that good. Just, just a thought, a starting place. <laughs> mm. a um, absolutely. And it's the kind of thing that we uh, in the organic movement have talked about for 50 years, really, um, anticipating that we would be not so much anticipating climate change, but anticipating the harms done from industrial agriculture to our to the overall ecosystem, um, and what a what a spiral downward that has turned out to be, and the potential that we could be doing good things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A really healthy ecosystem on a farm will filter water, so that the water that leaves the farm can be as clean or cleaner than the farmer that enter that as the water that enters the farm. You know, wouldn't that be a service that's worth paying for when you've got municipalities spending? millions of dollars cleaning water for drinking purposes. And we see that being done in the New York City watershed where farmers are being compensated for changing the way they're farming in a way that will produce cleaner water going into the uh, public water supply. It saves the public money in the long run because it's more expensive to take the stuff out than it is to, <laughs> it's a lot easier to keep it in than to get it back out or to keep it clean than to get it back out. Right. And uh, it makes me think of William McDonough, uh, the uh, dean of the School of Architecture down in Virginia, saying we need to put the filters in our minds instead of on the ends of pipes. If we can design systems that don't produce these things that we then have to spend a lot of money to take back out of them, we're all better off. And in the, the subject of the algal blooms, there's been a lot of research done in Ohio on them. And I actually attended some of the early meetings before we had the problem here in the Finger Lakes. And I asked how long it would be before New York would have the problem. And it was like six months after I was at that last meeting that New York had the first algal bloom. What was found in Ohio was that they could predict an algal bloom through a heavy rainfall event. That when there was a certain intensity of rainfall, they knew that there would be an algal bloom within a certain amount of time afterwards. And they were tracing the cause of the algal blooms back to a specific form of phosphorus that seemed to cause the harmful algae as opposed to the total phosphorus that was in the water. And this phosphorus was coming heavily off agricultural land. In fact, at, at one point they were asking how much of this is municipal phosphorus and how much of it is agricultural. And they did research in Ohio that showed it was almost all agricultural origin. But the research also showed that agriculture could modify so that it did not produce as much of it. And in the Finger Lakes, we have a specific problem. And what I've noticed is that we tend to have algal blooms when we have severe drought early, the crops are not growing, they're not taking up the phosphorus that we put out. And then you get this violent rain that washes the phosphorus into the lakes. There was mention of irrigation. If we could utilize the water that's in these lakes, we wouldn't need to irrigate the way the Central Valley does because we have plenty of total rainfall every year. If we could be using that as a temporary storage or as a buffer and be able to water our crops just for that little bit of bridge that mean when the timing is not right, 
we could actually increase crop yield and produce cleaner water by having the growth take that phosphorus out of the system. Just, I'm just pointing that as an opportunity. And there is a group of farmers in our county where there's a rain shadow that we have more frequent and more severe droughts than most of the state, where we could be using the pumps in the, at the power plant, which has been in the news because of all the negative problems it's caused, and move water onto farms that would then mitigate some of the environmental problems. Uh, the other thing it would do is allow us to grow some of these crops that the climate is now letting us grow, but they're risky because you, a certain an early period of water stress or a period of water stress near harvest can sometimes really be devastating to the yield. And if we had just that little bit of water for bridging, it would make us able to grow a bigger diversity of crops and actually more valuable crops than we are now. So I, uh, I'm optimistic because I feel that human ingenuity has a lot of potential to solve our problems. And I, I really need to shut my mouth and let someone else participate. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Klaus. And um, Chow, are you there to come back yeah, on? Um, yeah. Hi. Um, so I run Stick and Stone Farm. It's um, near Ithaca. About we, we raise about thirty-five acres of vegetables, but we manage uh, close to seventy acres of cropland to do that. And uh, we basically leave half of it out of production, um, and to try to build up the soil so that we can grow the vegetables. Um, from my perspective. Vegetables are a really intensive kind of crop. That's kind of why we leave half of our land out of production. Um, and uh, our farm kind of, in terms of climate change, we, we kind of focus more on adaptability rather than trying to um, help mitigate it, mainly because vegetables are so intensive that I, I don't think we are necessarily mitigating much by growing vegetables in and of themselves. Uh, the best way to really diversify for us would be to kind of uh, get uh, a pasture-based system involved in our operation, but that's not something we, we have the expertise or energy to take on at this point. Um, so in terms of what we've done to adapt, uh, we, we have been trying to keep the ground covered for longer periods. This is a, quite a challenge. In, vegetables, especially organic vegetables, um, at least at our scale. Um, and that's because uh, organic productions for vegetables uh, really depends on, at least in some part, uh, a fair amount of tillage to kill the weeds um, and to, to reduce weed pressure. So as we're keeping the ground covered for longer periods of time, we're finding uh, increased weed pressure, uh, which is a real challenge to deal with. Um, uh the other things you know if if we run a pond dry because we irrigated in a drought then we'll dig it deeper you know if we have flooding we'll we'll tile the spots that need tiling um so we've been investing a lot of uh, money and effort into kind of building these support systems and infrastructure systems on our farm. Um, one thing, uh, there's a couple things that I, I noticed that wasn't mentioned in the film. Otherwise, I would 100% agree with all the other farmers about the impacts of, of both drought and uh, heavy rainfall of uh, flooding on our farm as well. But um, I think a couple unique things that, at least for us, uh, wind damage, uh, especially to um, high tunnel structures, has been more and more intense. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're not the, the most uh, rigorous building um, technology out there. And we've had to replace our plastic more and more often. Um, and we have more and more of them. And part of the reason for having high tunnels is to kind of uh, um, mitigate the impacts of climate change there too. So uh, wind damage to our high tunnels is, has been greater we've had to replace our plastic more often uh, but the biggest actual economic cost to our farm in terms of climate change has actually been in the fall um, we grow ab about 50 percent of our crops are, are fall crops um, meaning we're growing uh, root crops or greens um, and things in high tunnels that uh, 
we're, we're harvesting in the fall and often selling through the winter. Um, and it, that has become more and more difficult, largely because of these polar vortexes that are coming in. So even if we have a, a relatively mild fall, one night of, of a very hard freeze can damage uh, a lot of crops and, and make them unharvestable for vegetables. And I would say in the last five years, we haven't, we've only been able to get in our harvest completely in once. Um, and uh, which was last year and all the other years we've, we've lost sometimes significant amount of crops um, because of hard freezes coming in much earlier than they have been in the past. So, I mean, we're talking about, uh, we've been farming for a, a, about 20 years and we, you know, kind of planned on getting our harvest out by Thanksgiving. Now we have to do it by early November. And even then, uh, there's a, there's, we're still thinking there's a risk. And I think a couple of years ago, we had a hard freeze in late October and lost a, a lot of our cabbage, uh, Napa cabbage to that. Um, so, and then the, you know, that can be very stressful. Uh, those days where we're, we know this hard freeze is coming. We, we basically have to make choices about what we should harvest. And that often comes down to how, what the economic value of the crop is, how tolerant it might be to the damage, um, and how efficient we could harvest it. So if it's going to take a while to harvest it, we'll maybe focus on things that we can get out of the ground a lot faster. Um, and that's not a great feeling to have to, to kind of, make those kinds of choices at the last second. So uh, I would say that in particular has been the greatest economic cost on our farm. Um, we've had certainly da damage due to uh, flooding and drought, but uh, because we are a diversified vegetable farm, we're planting every week from basically April, early April or whenever we can in early spring to uh, late August. We we never have something that's going to completely crush our farm and we never have um, any loss to some kind of severe weather event won't be to our entire crop for the year. Um, but because we have so much in the ground in the fall, that's that's been our biggest concern. Thank you so much. Um, and um, you have all my, my empathy for those having to make those kinds of choices when you've invested a whole season in planting, weeding, you know, caring for a crop and then have to choose, you know, which ones could get to market. Um, so we wanted to invite uh, our attendees to uh, put their questions in the, in the Q&A if you have any. But um, while people are doing that, I thought I'd kick us off with a question um, related to something both Katie and Graham mentioned, which was the Climate Action Council's draft plan uh, for how New York State is going to both adapt to climate change and reduce carbon emissions. And, you know, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, agriculture is, in New York State anyway, is only 6% of our emissions. And there are some calls for better manure management and um, around livestock production practices. But well, the main focus um, in the climate and the draft plan seems to be more around farmers helping us store carbon um, um, in the soil and on their lands. And so I am curious what your thoughts are in terms of what's the best way to structure this um, and what incentives would you like to see um, or regulatory controls to prevent destructive practices? Uh, Klaus had mentioned earlier this idea um, which I think a lot of people have had, like the Green Minister there from Germany, that um, we ought to be paying uh, farmers who have already been doing the right thing um, and finding some way to, you know, say no to practices that are destructive to the overall ecosystem and af affecting other people's life support systems, uh, frankly. Um, and, uh, you know, because many of our current um, incentives pay people to stop doing a bad thing, but we're not paying people who have been doing the good thing. So I just would love to hear what are your, how would you, what advice do you want to give the Climate Action Council on how to structure those incentives? 
I've this class. I've had a problem with subsidies in the past because when I see how they work, farmers tend to ask, "What is the minimum I can do to harvest this money?" And when the subsidy stops, the practice stops, and that's really not the intent of the subsidies. We we want to give incentives that are going to produce permanent change. And there are practices that are that are actually beneficial. It's a win-win situation that once a farmer starts doing them, they'll keep doing them. But I just haven't seen the current use of subsidies working in that way. And I think we need to use our heads a little better as to how to do it. There's another, another type of subsidy that I could see that I think would do more good. And that's helping build out the infrastructure. If we could get New York State, for instance, to help farmers in these more drought prone areas put in irrigation systems or at least provide the water that would allow them to put the irrigation systems in on their own reliably. It could have downstream effects. If we had some help putting in processing for some of these new crops we want farmers to grow, it's going to be a jump start to get those grown on the farms. Just a, just a thought on how to better make, get more bang for the buck. Uh, one other thing that came up listening to Chow especially, is we do have challenges with climate change due to the erraticness of the weather. And there's research in Europe that's really exciting about how agrivoltaics, the dual use between solar generation and agriculture can have some synergistic effects that nobody expected. Uh, for instance, they found that yields of grapes and of a lot of fruit crops under agrivoltaic panels that are taking some of the sunlight are greatly improved. In fact, the risk from hail can be eliminated under farms that are covered with this uh, dual use agrivoltaic system that's designed properly for it. Also early frosts are stopped because the radiational cooling that we get that causes some of the heavy damage from frost. Again, if you have the covering of the agrivoltaic panels, they will uh, prevent that. In midsummer, uh, they found that uh, the temperatures are lowered. And there are, was a whole group of crops they found that actually benefited from having a little less intense sunlight during the middle of the summer and a little lower temperatures. Uh, they even found that the health of cattle growing under panels was better because their body temperatures were lower. Uh, I would compare what they were seeing this to solar trees because cows do better under trees. The problem is when you put a lot of cows on a pasture, the trees don't live very long. A uh, solar panel wouldn't care how many cows are grazing under them. And in fact, the research showed that one of the problems of putting the panels out was if you didn't have enough of them out and if they weren't uniform, the cattle would over congregate under the, pa under the panels. Uh, unfortunately, our solar farm developers want class A flat soil. And when you tell them there's lots of class C soil here that could be being used, uh, they say, oh, we've looked at it and it's not available or we've looked at it and it's not practical, or we've looked at it and it's too expensive. I would say, you're full of prunes. Go tell your engineers to quit being so lazy and learn how to do this instead of just trying to do the easy thing. And, uh, um, that's the, that is going to be uh, one of our fall webinars is going to be on that topic of land use and renewable energy and taking a little bit of local control over some of right. these decisions. I wanted to, um, Turn it to, uh, to see if um, Chow had anything he wanted to add to that question. Yeah, I, I guess I would reiterate what Klaus said about um, subsidizing infrastructure. I think a lot of the practices that might are, are very experimental in terms of what we can be doing to um, both mitigate and um, adapt to climate change and. Uh, as a individual farmer, individual farmers, it's, it's often very uh, risky to invest in new technology, and sometimes in technology that doesn't even quite exist or isn't quite, you know, proven. And uh, having the 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 subsidy to you know help pay for equipment that might be needed to to change your farming practices would be. Um, for me, more enticing. Um, and uh, if it does work, then people will just want to use it, just like Klaus said. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean that that to me is 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 more enticing than than having to fill out the paperwork every year to 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 kind of do um, you know all the yeah I mean we do it we do uh, participate in what's called a CSP program uh, through NRCS and the amount of paperwork and it's just mind boggling to me and it's also very confusing. I have no idea why I'm getting paid what I'm getting paid or what I can do to change that or what <laughs> either positively or negatively. And it's just that every year I have to fill out the, these forms that are really completely mind boggling to me. And it takes <laughs> a couple days to fill them out. And uh, I, they're just so incredibly confusing and strange and uh arbitrary really a lot of it says well you have to do it this way and they don't give you a reason why or anything and you just say okay i did it this way and you take a picture of it and sh and send it in but it's just <laughs> kind of crazy and, uh, a lot of reform is going to be needed i think <laughs> right yeah. so but i guess my point is uh incentive that kind of, I mean, the CSP is there partly to pay you for things you've already done, which is why it's kind of confusing as to why you can't increase or decrease the amount of money you get from it. But a part of it is specific practices that somebody has decided that is good or uh, they want to incentivize in some way, but and they give you all these standards that don't make any sense to you or your farm necessarily. And I think that's the real challenge is uh, that kind of accounting can be very, very difficult. And um, it is tax dollars, so they do want to hold you accountable for it, but um, it just ends up being very confusing and arbitrary in my opinion, so. Thanks. Um, I want to acknowledge that um, we were going to wrap up at one uh, fifteen. But I invite the attendees and the panelists to stick with us uh, for a little while longer if you want to. Um, but if you need to leave, go ahead. This is being recorded and you can always check back in later. Um, uh, there are some questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, uh, Ryan, do you want to read them out? Sure, yeah, the first one came through from Rachel. He said, the concept that New York State can be the climate smart breadbasket is something we should capitalize on. How can we better advertise exciting agriculture prospects for New York State? Perhaps tapping into the I Love New York run by New York State government uh, advertising campaign could get the word out. This is something that I felt as a filmmaker and a storyteller that part of what's compelling here is that you don't have to have one or other. You can have a very successful, thriving land-based economy that can also be environmentally sustainable. And yes, that can definitely be part of the story. And I think, um, you know, Autumn Stochek has <clears throat> done a lot of that in the uh, cider world that you know, artisanal is, can also be really sustainable and there can be a real value to all of these things and more and more people really want to pay for these things. We have felt really well rewarded for stretching and doing things that we've never tried before. For instance, that we've grown winter lentils now three years in a row. And when you've got the only lentils that are grown in New York, uh, they sell out long before the year is out. And I, I feel like the public really is excited about food. The missing piece is you can't eat a lentil the way it looks when it comes out of a combine bin. Somebody has to get the weed seeds out of it. Somebody has to get the fines and the soil out of it. Lentils don't grow very tall, so there's always soil and a little bit of stone in them. Uh, we invested a fairly large amount of money in the equipment, optical sorting machines and cleaners that uh, will make these types of foods marketable to the general public. And this is another example of if we could have help from the state, this would have, have a bigger bang for the buck because other farmers could also grow these crops if they have the infrastructure in place that makes them able to uh, be sold then. Uh, one of the hurdles that we're having trouble with is actually, in, uh, ironically, the Food Modernization Safety Act. It's cost nothing. It's almost nothing to Cargill to hire full time people to comply with the law. And yet it could be financially ruinous for a farmer who's trying to 
grow a small amount and take it to take it to the public to uh, comply with the law, to fill out all the paperwork, to fill out everything that needs to be there and get the permits. If we could get help from New York State, and this might be a role where extension could play a role for compliance so that smaller producers who try something new can still comply with the Food Modernization and Safety Act and bring their products to the, to the market without taking an undue risk and without violating the law, it would really be a big help. Maybe a more of a concept of a circuit rider to help do the paperwork. Similar to a lot of our energy contractors who don't want to do nice service paperwork. And I've often suggested, you know, maybe you guys should get together and hire somebody to do your paperwork for all of you. And then nobody has to have that headache. But we have an, a question that came in earlier over in the chat from Aaron um, to the farmers. Are you concerned that the increased mandated practices to meet climate goals will accelerate consolidation of farms and edge smaller producers out? I feel like the bigger ones are less resilient and less able to adapt. Uh, what we have a bigger problem with is access to capital. I think what's making the large farms grow is really not that they're more efficient or more profitable. I, in fact, I can show you in black and white that they're not, but they have advantages in access to capital. And beginning farmers, and this is one of my pet peeves, is I'm getting kind of old. We need young farmers. And along with new people on the ground and younger bodies to do the work, there are younger minds with more ideas. Diversity pays off in just the human capital that comes there of new ideas, trying new things and uh, trying different things. And we're kind of shutting that off by having a very high barrier to entry for young farmers, minority farmers, you know, groups that have not been in agriculture very long. And I think we're losing out on a huge amount of potential benefit, not making it so hard for these uh, non-traditional farmers to become farmers. That really relates a little bit to one of the questions over in the Q&A from Reggie, which was uh, farmer bonds that we could buy. Um, how can a lot of, it's our tax dollars that are being spent and policies and decisions are being made to distribute our tax dollars. Is there a way that we can more easily control and choose how they're directed in terms of what kind of farming system do we want to support? Interest rate buy downs would do that. Pardon? A, a system that maybe included interest rate buy downs. Oh. I can't see giving people money. And that seems to be a recipe for problems. But if they could, if we could get a level playing field by buying down interest rates or possibly by even giving access at all, uh, so many minority groups, when they go to a bank and want to borrow money, uh, they get a lot of encouragement and told to go somewhere else. You know, that's access, uh, loan guarantees and buy downs are a huge tool that I think could have huge social effects. Mm -hmm. And I know there's been conversation about, you know, like a community land trust where um, land is made available, especially to beginning farmers. Uh, um, and just like the Finger Lakes Land Trust is able to step in on behalf of the state to quickly protect some land, we need that kind of uh, a cash bank to buy up a big dairy farm when it's being transferred rather than the big dairy farm next door buying it up, that kind of That's thing. That's right. But quite often that it never even comes available because yeah. the bank will make a deal with another bank. They'll take their loss, put it on the books of the other farm at below market value. The other farm looks like it made a lot of money. On paper, they did. And it just subsidizes the other farm to keep running at a loss a little longer. And I'm not stretching here. This is, these are, I know the numbers behind this. I think that that is one of the reasons why it's so important that the public, everybody on this webinar and in our networks, be aware of the need to submit their comments to the draft climate action plan. This is a place, there is a ag and markets, you know, committee on the plan. Um, where we can be providing this kind of feedback and guidance on what kind of a food system we need to be designing for. And um, especially since equity is at the heart of the, um, the, the CLCPA, you know, this is an opportunity to really 
say you have to design for equity then? At the risk of taking too much time, I'm seeing an inequity across the country. And almost invariably, if you see the farms that African-American farmers have, if you see the farms that young farmers have and the, see the farms that female farmers have, they tend to be the poorest land. It's the land where climate change is causing the most problems and causing the biggest losses. They don't seem to have access to the prime soil that gives produces an advantage for the farmer. And I don't know how we level that playing field. The other place where minority farmers and non-traditional farmers have a disadvantage is access to financing for land improvement. Because some of this second class soil, if it had enough artificial drainage put under it, if it had our irrigation systems put in it, if it had the diversion ditches and the water and sediment control basins, all these things that improve the soil done would become much more productive. But if the if a farmer just squeaks by to even get access to the land, then getting that kind of financing to improve the land so that it can be, live up to its potential is still another hurdle. And this is another place where loan guarantees and interest buy downs or or even access to the credit at all could make a difference. I definitely want to get in touch with you again, Klaus, to, to harvest more of these ideas as we, you know, become, um, we are in the process of becoming sustainable Finger Lakes and want to host a lot of this kind of thinking across the region together. And what's the infrastructure that we need to be building, you know, much more significant infrastructure, financial, um, um, than we have in the past. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, there's another one down here. Um, Chris Turner, adding to Reggie's question, some of us business owners in tourism recognize our emerging reliance on the status of new food, foodie agriculture. How can we support these businesses as business owners? Wow, that's easy to do. <laughs> uh, we've, we've been working with our neighboring wineries. And it's amazing what a synergistic benefit there is to both when, for instance, our uh, grain cleaning facility, which was kind of a stretch. If I hadn't been in business for many years and had some equity, I could never have borrowed the money to build this facility that allows us to, to process food. But the wineries just love to be able to have local beans, bread made from a local artisan wheat variety, uh, local pearl barley, any of these crops, they're on display. And one of our uh, neighbors is doing pairings of, of wine and breads where the wheat and the grapes grew on the same soil. And the flavors are complementary. where he's putting a winemaker and an artisan baker together. So th these are just ideas that have really made excitement and fun. <laughs> really sounds fun. <laughs> And I, I think we've, we haven't even scratched the surface. There's a lot of potential here for businesses to just reach out and do things together. Uh, Wegmans has actually worked with us quite a lot. And uh, I, I think they've gotten a lot of good publicity and a lot, created a lot of good feeling, but they, they're not the only ones that know how to do this. Uh, I think there's more, more ideas further down in the food chain than there, there is at the top. Yeah. Well, um, it, it's getting late, and if there are questions here and there in the, in the chat and the Q&A that we haven't gotten to, um, we'll send them to the panelists and see if anybody wants to respond, and we can, um, I think we will have the email of any of the people who posed the question, you know, so that we can get back to you. I, I believe that's how it will work. Um, I just want to say thank you so much <laughs> to the four of you and to Shira for her film and for everybody for attending, um, joining us for this first Finger Lakes forecast webinar. Um, I hope you all stay engaged on this topic of regional food security. It's, it's so, so key <laughs> and there's a lot to be done, but there's also, gosh, we have so much exciting um, resources you know that we already have in place and that are coming together so we've got a lot to work with as well as you know concerns uh, about the future and as uh, several of you have pointed to uh, earlier one of the take-home actions that every all of us can do is to focus more on buying local wherever you can whether that's at a restaurant or um, at the grocery store you know be looking for those local products um, 
you know, uh, I always think of England learning their lesson in World War II that they needed to have in place not only tillable land, but people who knew how to farm when they were surrounded by, you know, submarine, um, uh, what do you call that when there's a barricade, uh, a blockade uh, against any food being delivered to you, you better be ready to produce it yourself. And um, that certainly is our, our capacity and, um, you know, um, a duty really for ourselves as well in terms of feeding others who might not be able to. Um, so uh, I'm really hoping that people will make their voices heard on the climate action plan and provide feedback. Um, you know, on what are, the, are those policies that we would like to see um, and, and emphasize that they need to be paying attention to the smaller farmers and the diverse farmers. I wanna invite everyone to join us next month for our next webinar on uh, Wednesday, May 25th at noon. Uh, for uh, the topic is reducing flood risk in your home. We're going to have Scott Doyle, who's formerly of Tompkins County Planning and Sustainability Department, uh, who's going to share with us the, all the risk analysis work that's gone on with our hazard mitigation plan and the new FEMA floodplain maps, which are some pretty serious changes ahead for people who are now in floodplains um, you know, that are documented. We're also gonna be joined by two local insurance brokers, Sally Hoyt of Tompkins Insurance and Bob Baxter from Dryden Mutual. Both of them have been helping homeowners and business owners figure out if they can't afford the FEMA flood insurance, what can they afford uh, to protect? And then finally, Alan Springett, who's a geologist now retired from FEMA is going to talk about then what can you do to physically reduce the risk of flooding to your home? And I'm not so much talking about the people who live right next to a creek or the lake, but rather people who are facing increased sheet runoff um, flooding into their homes. Uh, so we're hoping that that will be really useful to people to, um, to, to be anticipating um, you know, higher, more intense rainfall events in their near future. Uh, you can register for that flood, flood webinar. Um, I don't know if Ryan, you already put it in the this chat that's really filled up, um, but uh, it's uh, bit.ly slash May 25 forecast. Maybe Ryan can stick that in the chat so you can grab it there to register for that event. And I, again, want to thank everybody. This has been so interesting and just sort of like a leaping off point for a lot of conversation that needs to ha happen again in the future to go deeper and to maybe develop some kinds of campaigns around in terms of, all right, then, you know, in the past, we tried to create a Cayuga Local Investing Opportunity Network. Can we get back to work on something like that so that we can find a way to you know, uh, push the taxpayer dollars in a direction that uh, we think is